Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the heart to worship and serve you in the church, your body. Please grant wisdom and understanding to the brothers and sisters who made up their mind to work for young souls and give them your power and help them so that they can do well the ministry you are entrusted to them. The Lord Holy Spirit, please work throughout this session today and we are going to think together about the proper attitudes of the saints for serving the Lord. Lord, please walk before us and grant us the words we need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, uh, let's look at Psalm 34. Psalm 34. It's a long chapter, but I will read it from verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he, hear, he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to me, looked to him, and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. All oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, there is no one to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the, uh, the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord can redeem the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Let's read verse 11 together. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Today we are going to learn together with the title of Good Teacher. First, let's take a look at Psalm 89. 89 verse 20. Let's read it together. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. It says... I, God, have found my servant David. I have found my servant David. From Genesis to Revelation, God has been looking for sinners. Not only sinners, but the Lord is also looking for his servants. 
That's why he found David to establish the United Kingdom of Israel. And for the history of the Exodus, God was looking for a person who could lead the people out of Egypt, right? That's why Moses was born. For the United Kingdom of Israel, God found David. It is the fact that the Lord is also looking for workers for primary, secondary and A-level students in our time. Not only David, but he is also looking for workers to work for the young lives. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. As it says, the Lord finds a worthy person, he gives him the power he needs, and gives him everything. So if your foundation is not prepared, the Lord will not give, give to you. That's why it's a very important matter to become a teacher and be used preciously before the Lord. So, in order to be used preciously as a teacher before the Lord, you must first be saved, of course. First of all, you must be genuinely saved, and since you will lead people to the Lord, you must be close to the Lord. Those who are near, draw near to the Lord and imitate the Lord will be able to become servants of the Lord. So today, as we meditate on who is a good and worth teacher in the sight of the Lord, Psalm 24 seems to describe well what kind of teacher is a good teacher. So if we go through Psalm 34, we will be able to see exactly the qualities of a good teacher before the Lord. And if you read Psalm 34 carefully, whenever you have time, you will find the things God desires. So let's think about it together. Let's look at verse 1. Are we blessed the Lord at all times? His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It says, at all times and continually. It will be very important for teachers to have a right relationship with God and to have a lasting faith. Persistence, persistent faith. As it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So the most basic quality is to have a right relationship with God to live a God-centered life and to have persistence and continuity in faith life. So if you serve without persistence, you will not be used preciously. As the Bible says, like the chaff which the wind drives away, you should not go back and forth following the winds of the world. If you do, you won't be able to do the Lord's work. Jesus said, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? John the Baptist was not like a reed shaken by the wind. He, he was very firm. The Lord wants a person who is not like a reed shaken by the wind, but who is firm and consistent like a tree planted by rivers of water. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever it does shall prosper. A tree planted by the rivers of water is fixed at one place, which is persistence. So all fruits are born in the midst of persistence. That's why we cannot be a precious worker without persistence. Just like farming requires patience, saving and establishing a soul requires patience, persistence and continuity. So the first thing highlighted here is, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In the church life, it is not possible to lead a person into the arms of the Lord 
and establish that person strong in a short amount of time. Just as it takes many years to grow a tree, shouldn't it take time to establish a person upright? Humans don't change easily. There are many married people here. Do husbands and wives change quickly or not? No. Likewise, it also takes a long time to change children. The salvation is free of charge, but rest is not. Nothing's easy. So it's not possible to bear fruit without patience, continuity and persistence. So the first thing emphasized here is the persistence of faith and, and similar. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And second, the teacher must recognize his weak and lacking. Verse 6, let's read it together. The poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. This poor man... David went through many afflictions. This poor man. Verse 2 also says, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. So similar expressions are mentioned twice. This poor man and the humble. But David called himself this poor man. A person who knows his weakness, shortcomings, inability and misery can understand spiritual things. And here the word poor man means a man who is humble in heart. A poor man is lowly in heart. A poor man knows his weakness. He knows that he is lacking. So people who feel their poverty, weakness and shortcomings can humble their hearts. And the Lord makes them understand many things. And especially people who try to save younger ones. If they don't humble their heart, then the children, they can't establish them. If your heart is higher than the children and students, you will try to control them, but you won't be able to win their hearts. In order to lead the hearts of the children, you have to know their hearts. And unless you humble your hearts further, you cannot touch and move them. If you force them with authority, they might follow, but their hearts can't change. He says, this poor man. So in your Christian life, if you are given a situation where you, where you can feel your inability and weakness a lot, then that is a very good thing for a teacher. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Verses 2 and 3. Let's read it together. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In order to enter heaven, we humbled our hearts like children, so we were saved. What is the way to become great after being saved? Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Why did Jesus say this? We have a blackboard here. Let's say this is me. 
I can either lift up or humble my heart like a child. But when my heart is humbled like a child, The children come into sight. When I'm humbled, I can see the ch students, little ones, and those who are suffering when I'm humbled. So the reason why Jesus said, whoever humbles himself is the greatest is because if we become proud, a problem arises that we can only see people in high positions. So as the Bible says, whoever receives one little child who can receive one little child if you become proud you will despise children if you become proud you will cause others stumble if you become proud you will despise and ignore others. If you become proud, you won't forgive others. All kinds of problems will rise. But if you humble yourself, you will become great because those who humble their hearts will consider younger ones precious and be careful so they will not make others stumble. The people who humble their hearts might look weak but do not despise or disregard others in their hearts. Conflicts may arise while doing the Lord's work, but if we humble our hearts, even when we are criticized, it's not a, not a big problem. But what would happen if we regard ourselves as a good person and exalt ourselves? It would cause many problems. So people who went through many afflictions, suffered a lot and went through a lot of situations that humble them, have such a big heart that they can understand the hearts of various kinds of people. So in order to become a worthy teacher before the Lord, first of all, a person must have persistence in their Christian life and continue to live a Christian life, rain or shine. They, that person can do the Lord's work. Also, a person who recognizes they are weak, lacking, and poor has a humble heart so they can serve others. Let's go back to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 4. Verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And verse 6, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. So he is praying. The praying is important for teachers. In verse 4, I sought the Lord, and in verse 6, this poor man cried out. Saving and establishing soul, souls cannot be done by our own means and methods. That's why the Bible says, go into your, your room, go into your, your room, and shut your door, and pray to the Lord. We need to make time for personal fellowship with the Lord and a quiet time to cry out to the Lord and ask for God's help. Only then can we save the save and establish others. Like it says here, I sought the Lord and this poor man cried out. There are many verses saying that Jesus went to a solitary place. A solitary place. And Jesus departed to a solitary place and there he prayed he departed to a solitary place he departed to a solitary place 
and there he prayed. So what is a solitary place? It is the place where he is with Father God. So Jesus was busy with a lot of work, but in order to carry out the work, he always went to a solitary place, had, had fellowship with Father God, and always worked by the power gained from there. Work didn't come first. He had time to communicate with Father God in a solitary place and he worked with that strength. So you know why the period of the judges came. In Judges chapter 1, the people asked the Lord, but what's written at the end of the judges? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So in Judges 1, the people asked the Lord. So in Judges 1, the people asked the Lord. When the children of Israel asked God, there were order in all of Israel's life and the working of the Lord. There were, they were all done work. However, when they did what was right in their own eyes, with, without asking God, when did according to their own opinions and means, without asking God, what did come into the history of Israel? Disorder came. Chaos came, and there was full of misery instead of the work of the Lord. So if we trust in our own reason and thoughts and act without asking God when doing the Lord's work, there will be disorder, chaos, misery, and fruitlessness. That's why we must ask the Lord. So the teacher must First, be a person who has constant sincerity and must have persistence and then know their shortcomings and weaknesses. Those who think themselves are proud are not actually proud. But those who think, I'm qualified enough to be a teacher, I'm capable enough, cannot be used. People who know that they are weak and lack can be used preciously. The Lord will give them wisdom and help them. So first time district leaders do well. But those who have been doing it for years become accustomed to it like a habit. And there are many cases where they do worse. At first, they always ask the Lord. After a while, it becomes a habit, so they do it the way they normally do it. So even when there is a problem, they may not notice it. So when you start thinking, I'm doing enough, problems start to rise. So you always make, make mistakes if you trust in your own reason and thoughts. And Joshua had always asked the Lord, but he didn't ask when the Gibeonites came, so he made a mistake. He did according to his own thoughts because he thought that there was nothing wrong with his judgments, so he made a mistake. So teachers are most successful at first. People who are used to it, to do it in the way they normally do it and make a mistake. Ask the Lord. If you ask, the Lord may prevent you from making mistakes in advance. He make you He may make you realize. And number four. The teachers need need experiences of faith. Let's look at Psalm thirty four verse four. So how great it would be if our teachers and new teachers have more experiences of faith. Let's look at verse four. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6, 
This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. I sought the Lord. The people who experienced the deliverance of the Lord, who experienced that the Lord saved them from their troubles when they cried out to the Lord, not only the experience of salvation, but also various experiences in the Christian life are necessary. So we need knowledge. But the more people actually experience the Word, the more powerful the church score will be. Some people parade experiences only, but experiences that are not based on the word are dangerous. And such experiences can become mysticism. So those who have a lot of experiences based on the on the word, it will be much easier to take hold of others. There are people who have experienced poverty in their Christian life. People who have very, who have lived very, very difficult lives, people who have lived in poverty, well understand the hearts of the poor. There are people who suffered from depression in the past. When we visited a sister who had depression, nothing comforted comforted her. But when someone who once had a depression talked to her, sister, you must feel like this and that. It moved her heart. Those who suffered from depression knows very well the state of mind of the people with depression. So, if a person with depression tells their situation, they can quickly relate it to it, and the person is comforted and encouraged by it. So, those who have experienced can comfort the difficulties of others. Let's say I am in charge of secondary or A level students. If I had many difficulties during the A level, like a bullying, for example, it's much easier. For me to take hold of A level students who are feeling lost, feeling lost. So what you experienced before you were saved can be a good experience, and what you experienced after being saved can be also very helpful. So you might have had an illness or a, or a conflict as a step sibling. That could be a conflict between siblings, right? So you might have conflicts within your family or go through. Financial difficulties. That there, there are people who experienced various difficulties, but overcome by relying on the Lord. So we need such people with a lot of experience of faith. So actually, secondary and A-level students don't have much understanding. They don't have much, many experiences because they are served by their parents and go to school. In contrast, workers and married people go through various things. So those who have many experiences in life is in a good position to help others. God caused David to go through a lot of difficulties and problems. And the reason is because only then can he rule the country. It requires a lot of experiences to establish, at least the people I come in contact with. If the Lord really wants me to be a teacher, an effective teacher, He will let me go through a lot of things. Therefore, the more you receive the given situation with thanksgiving, and overcome it, the more competent you will be as a teacher, and the more people you will definitely be able to establish. And those who experience the Lord's answer to their prayers can encourage others in others in difficulty to pray by talking about their experience of answered prayers. So you have to have experience of being helped be before helping others. And among the new teachers, mothers have an advantage because they have experience of raising children. So they can deal with students and establish them with a. Motherly heart, in a much more advan advantageous position. And if you are a school teacher, you could be an even better position as a teacher. You have dealt dealt with children, so you can be in a very advantage ad advantageous position in dealing with children. That's why it's a very important to experience something in our Christian life. Otherwise. It only remains as knowledge and words. Let's look at Psalm thirty-four, verse eight. 
Let's read it together. All taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Tasting and seeing means it's not abstract. Just as we taste and know food, taste and see that the Lord is good. So those who have experienced the love of the Lord will be able to proclaim that love to others with the love that they received from the Lord. That's why we need experiences. So we need to taste the word and the Lord's answers to prayers and to experience the salvation of souls during evangelism and to feel joy in service and to experience conflicts within fellowship and also the comfort of the Lord in it. And the more you experience, the more advantageous position you will be in. So there is a difference between a newly saved pe person and a person who has been saved for some time. Those who have been trying hard to live worthy of the Lord have a lot of experiences. Those who, but those who only receive salvation but do not live their Christian life in a worthy manner are still children. So how, however, the, for those who were saved many years ago and have lived diligently in the Lord have, have not only eaten a lot of rice but have experienced many things in it. That's why they definitely have something different from newly saved Christians. At first glance, there seems to be no difference between a new evangelist and a long-time evangelist in the church life. But when an important problem arises, the new evangelist doesn't know what to do. But a long-time evangelist who has, a, has evangelist experience for a long time solves the problem quickly. When a problem arises, the ways how they deal with it are different. It has to be different. Likewise, when there is a problem, the way someone who has been in the church for a long time solves it is different from the other who is not. So when a problem occurred, one does not know what to do, but the, the other with a long time experience can solve it quickly. It's similar to that. So taste and see that the Lord is good. So those who cling to the Lord and want to live in the truth, the Lord will let them taste and see. Jacob had 12 sons, but why did God give the 11th son Joseph more afflictions and let him understand more things? Why? What's the reason? It was because Joseph tried harder to live a worthy life than the other sons. So if you really desire to establish young lives upright and be to be used preciously by the Lord and do your ministry with an honest heart, the Lord will undoubtedly allow you to experience various things so that you can establish them. The Lord will never let things happen by chance but make you experience various things. So miraculously, he will make you experience, help your fellowship with children and solve their problems. So it's amazing. So when the thing you, you desire pleases the Lord, the Lord will surely give it to you. So when I was first saved, I felt the need to learn the Bible properly. So do you know what was my deepest wish? My deepest wish was this. I have to save souls. God, please help me to learn the Bible properly. That's my deepest wish. So I tried so hard to learn the Bible properly, no matter what. So because this is the word of God, so I put my heart into it and put a lot of effort into it. So it was not for a selfish purpose. It's not for my gain, but it's to save and establish souls in a right way. So I honestly prayed for help to really understand the word. And then amazingly, God guided me to understand the word. So if a person has honest desire and heart to establish students with all his heart, 
and has love towards the young lives and the lives of students, then the Lord will give him wisdom, make him experience things and taste and see the goodness of God in it, so that he can establish the children. Surely God will do that. So faith experience is necessary. For those who long to live in the truth, the Lord will surely enable them to do so. So the important thing is aspiration. So if you have a determination to establish your students in the Lord, the Lord will give you experiences. So you get the idea, right? So let's move on. Psalm 34, verse 5. Verse 5. Let's read it together. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. It says, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. When we were saved, the light of the Holy Spirit came into us, so our hearts were brightened up. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. We can get a hint from here. So is a depressed teacher good or bad? A teacher shouldn't be depressed. Does a married person, a wife, have to be depressed or bright? The married person, the wife should be bright at home. So if the wife is not bright at home, the whole family will become dark. So in the church, the teachers should not be irritable. And... A depressed of teacher is not worthy either. So a teacher must have a bright heart. So if you treat others with a bright heart, if you have a bright heart, what can you do? So you can communicate with the students with a smile. So even if you, even if we keep our mouths closed, but if we are smiling, so can we still have fellowship or not? Yes, we can. However, if the teacher is angry and irritable, then an intimate Fellowship won't be possible, right? So when we feel sad, we should go out and grieve, but we have to be bright when we are dealing with the students. When we become a bright, uh, so when we become a bright teacher, we can save and establish others. So they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. It is the same when preaching to the unsaved. So you look, you all look beautiful. So if you look closely at the uh, church school teachers, some teachers save, save and establish very well. So they all have a bright heart. Their minds are not complicated. That's why, that's why they can have good fellowship with the children. If a mother makes a serious face and when she's talking to her kids, can she have a, have a good fellowship or not? No, she can't. When we treat each other with a bright heart, we can have a good fellowship. So even in the family, the husband and wife need to be bright to have fellowship with each other. So without a bright heart, it's not easy to have fellowship. So as it says here, having a bright heart is necessary for teachers. So number six, a teacher should not fall into self-satisfaction but should continue to make progress let's look at Psalm 34 34 verses 9 and 10 let's read it together all fear the Lord you his saints there is no one to those who fear him 
the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. The important part here is, those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And God will provide those who seek the Lord with, with everything they need. Any good thing. The God has prepared all good things. So to become to become a Lord's teacher and be used preciously by the Lord cannot be done by our own ways and means because we distribute what we have received from the Lord and there are so many good things of the Lord. We shouldn't think it is enough. This is enough. Since our Lord is not lacking in all good things, Christians, especially teachers, should strive to make constant progress in the faith. So in the book of Philippians, there are three types of progress. Fatherance of the gospel, progress of faith, and your progress. So the Bible tells us that we must progress. I'm already doing enough. This is enough. People with such hearts are definitely going to retreat. There are so many things to conquer and to understand. So we shouldn't say Lord, this is enough for me. My grace is sufficient for you. This, this word applies to people like Moses and Paul, but not to us because we need more of the lost grace, more of the lost power, and more of the lost things. If you do not more honestly desire, you cannot be used preciously by the Lord. So I'm better than others. That mind is not fitting. There are so many forefathers of faith before us. Compared to them, we are nothing. So, I'm better than other brothers and sisters. If you think that way, you will fall behind. The Lord has prepared all good things for us to develop our talents and gifts to the maximum to give, to give Him the greatest glory. Because the Lord has prepared all things that pertain to life and godliness, He can give us if we ask for His help. So please, don't think it's enough. When I went to Hong Kong, a sister told me, I'm not comparable to the saints in Korea, but among those here in Hong Kong, I will try to get in the lost good books and be used most preciously before the Lord. So it's very important to have a heart to do well before the Lord in the Christian life. It's necessary and important to do the Lord's work in, a, in, in such a way that you make progress and do better, even a little. Let's look at the scripture. So First Chronicles. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 9, verses 9 and 10, let's read it together. Now Jabez was more honourable than his, his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez. 
saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. Now, <clears throat> Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His brothers were also honorable, but Jabez was more honorable. But his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. The name Jabez means sorrow. It seems that his mother did not only suffer the pain of childbirth, but something was going on in the family. So it seems that he gave birth to Jabez, not only in the pain of childbirth, but also in the great pain of the family. So she named his son Sorrow. There must have been a very big conflict and tragedy in that family. saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez might have lacked something. But he prayed before God. God, you would bless me indeed. So it's not simply bless me, but meant, Lord, you have blessed me, but please bless me more. It is a blessing to be saved. But, but if we can do church ministry, it is a greater blessing. Bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. Lord, I only cared about my salvation and maintaining my faith after salvation. But now, Lord, you have broadened my heart to serve you. So, Lord, please enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. Jabez had the help of the Lord. He was not satisfied with that but also asked please give me strength and power to enlarge my territory so that I can be used more preciously before the Lord. Please help me to me do me more to do this work. So he prayed that way and that honest prayer enabled him to do more work. So if you think this is enough, you are going backwards. Is it enough? Of course not. So becoming a teacher, if the Lord gives you strength, you will be able to establish more souls, won't you? And if you really have a right attitude, the Lord could assign to you the students who will become precious workers. So you never know who will be assigned to you. If we pre present our hearts rightly to the Lord, we never know what the Lord will do for us. So it is good it is good to be content in the Christian life and it is necessary to be content with the matter of living but the Christian life requires longing. So in the Christian life we need longing, spiritual longing and a desire to be used more preciously before the Lord. It is absolutely necessary to have an honest desire to live by the power of the Lord know more about the Lord and live in the truth of the Lord. And number seven, the teachers have to be trained. Uh, you should sacrifice and labor. Let's go to Psalm 34. Let's read verse 19 together. Verse 19 together. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The righteous here refers to Jesus, 
Jesus had many afflictions, but he was saved from them all. He also refers to the saved people in the Lord. The righteous suffer many afflictions. Although many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. That is amazing. The many are the afflictions of the righteous. The afflictions of the righteous are many. Many are the afflictions of the righteous because they are saved. There are sufferings that they have to suffer before the Lord. Also, many are the afflictions of the righteous means that those who desire to live and actually live according to the will of the Lord after being saved are the true righteous people. People who live according to the will of the Lord have many afflictions. Jacob had 12 sons, but among them, the 11th son Joseph really tried hard to live in the truth, didn't he? That's why the Lord gave him more afflictions. And Job also strived to live in the truth in his day, so he had more afflictions than anyone else. But David suffered a lot in his day. Why? Because the righteous have many afflictions. Here among us, those who really long to live in the, in the word of the Lord and those who actually live in the will of the Lord will surely have many afflictions. The Lord will give them difficulties. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Moses was a proud man when he was first called. For the first 40 years, he was proud. The person who said this was D.L. Moody. After 40 years of life in the wilderness, he was humbled. And then for the remaining 40 years, he became a man of God. So even Moses was trained for 40 years. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And the teacher also has many afflictions. The church school teachers are different from the worldly teachers. So what's the difference between a church school teacher and a pastor? What's the difference between a church school teacher, a worldly teacher and a preacher? The teachers of the world who have taught for a few years, even though they teach habitually, habitually it doesn't bring a serious problem. They can just teach English or maths. Even if they don't put their heart into it, it doesn't cause a big problem. However, for the preacher, if they say the same thing but their heart does not match, then they are not worthy at all as a preacher. So they can't be a preacher. So evangelism is something that cannot be done habitually. Likewise, if teachers do habitually uh, because they have been doing it for years, then they are just the same as worldly people. And they will then then they will completely fail. So unless our hearts are renewed, we cannot deal with the souls. So that's why the Lord may continue to weave difficulties in various ways and let the teachers go through those difficulties in their Christian life in order to renew their hearts. So it's an inevitable truth that the more afflictions you suffer, the more competent you become as a teacher. So let's look at Psalm 34 again. So Psalm 34, verse 11. Calm your children, listen to me, it says. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Even a great, great man, David, said, your children. David thought it is very natural for him to teach the children. So you should not think of the work given to you as a small thing. I 
I'm so old. Should I teach the young people? Should I connect with the, pe the children? You shouldn't think like that. Calm your children. Listen to me, your children. And David considered being around with the little ones very precious. Says, you know, all those who did great things in the Bible, they that great things while obeying the little things. So you know what Saul was doing when he was anointed. He went on an errand for his father and was anointed. So Saul was a man who was a, who was good at obeying his child, his parents, and also David was keeping the sheep as he as his father commanded him when he was anointed, and when he killed Goliath, Goliath he was on the way to do an errand for his father and ended up killing Goliath. So although it is a very it is a small task, by faithfully doing that task assigned to you, you will achieve great things. Whatever we do in the church is by no means small. So those who think that what they do is a small thing will be in trouble. So it's never a small thing. So we must remember that anything concerning the soul is not a small thing. So number number nine, the teachers should be careful with words and behavior. So verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The verse 13 says tongue and verse 14 do good, which is about action. So it's saying that you must be careful with your words and action. So in particular, those who become teachers must be careful with their tongue, right? You should not speak harsh words. You should not say aggressive words. Some people won't let others, others speak. A person said, let's play a word, word chain. I will start uranium. The other player is stuck saying a different word other than uranium, please. Okay, then sodium, uh, sodium hydroxide and stuck again. If you stop people from speaking even from the beginning, then you won't be able to have a conversation. So you must be careful not to say aggressive, harsh and resentful words. I believe that you won't speak such words. In, that, in addition, you shouldn't be complaining. Those who become teachers should never say anything that complains about the church, especially about the brothers and sisters. Otherwise, the students who hear it will get hurt. You should never say anything negative. And children have such a good memory. So you will find it later that it looks like the ch students do not listen well during the sermon, but in fact, they are listening. And if the teacher says something bad, then they remember it well. So if teachers say about pastors, church, fellow teachers or anything else, it goes into the ears of the children and they won't forget it, though they are only children. So you have to be careful not to complain when you talk and you should not criticize, slander or say things like that. So you shouldn't do that. And you have to be careful not to say things that subtly demean others. And any fights between teachers are fatal to students. So teachers must be careful with words and behaviors. And because teachers have to keep the rules, you have to come on time and you have to train yourself to control your words and behavior as well so that you can be an example in those. So you must be careful because children mostly learn from what they see. Number 10, since a teacher is a person who teaches, you have to study a lot. What do you have to study? 
you have to think a lot about Christ and need to have a solid knowledge of the truth of the gospel. This is the last look at verse 20. Let's read verses 20 through 22 together. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. His gods, he guards all his bones. Whose bones are they? Who does the bones refer to? Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was the Passover lamb, his bones were not broken. The bones of the two thieves who were dying next to his cross were, were broken, but the bones of Jesus were not. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. It's saying that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his, his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. So verse 21 says, those who sh those shall be condemned, and verse 22 says, none of those shall be condemned. Why shall none of those be condemned? He guards all his bones, which means Jesus is the Passover lamb. Therefore, Those who trust in him, the Passover lamb, shall not be condemned. So those who are under the Passover lamb shall become righteous and not be condemned. But whoever does not trust in the Passover lamb, evil shall slay the wicked. It's telling that those who do not receive Jesus will be judged by God. So what teachers, what teachers should keep in mind is that we are the people who put Christ into other people, right? So we are the people who put Christ and things pertaining to Christ into the into the souls. So what are we trying to put in our students? The purpose of becoming a teacher is to make others believe in Christ, rely on Christ and imitate Christ. So you have to have uh, something to give to your children. That's why you have to have Christ and a lot, thing, a lot of things about Christ. To do that, you have to meditate on the word, study it, and make it your own. So let's go to Psalm 111. Let's read it together. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. The works of the Lord are great. The words, the works of God are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Without a desire to study, we cannot fully understand and teach. So what we need to study is how to move students' hearts. What should I tell the students to move their hearts so that they can get close to Christ? You have to keep studying it in order to move the hearts of the children and students and make, their, make them turn to the Lord. And you have to be prepared in advance to answer to their questions. So it, it would be good to do that if possible. So after I was saved, I read a lot of books about questions and answers at first because I had to answer to those who asked. So I read almost all the books. So in the bookstore, I searched all the questions and answers books books that answer to the, the questions that the unsaved people ask and read them. 
read them because if people asked, I need to know how to answer through the Bible. So if we, if I can't give an answer, someone else can do it. But it would be nice if I can do it. So it's necessary for teachers to think about and write down all the various questions and prepare answers beforehand. So you can't answer to everything, but if you give an answer when you're asked, it will increase your credibility, wouldn't it? So it is essential to prepare, as the scripture says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, you a reason. So in order to become a teacher who is prepared for the Lord, we must believe in the power of God first. What's the biggest thing that moves moves people's hearts? So we need to be sure that the word of God has power. If you do not trust in the power of power of the word, you will not become a worthy teacher. So you must believe that the word of God has more power than a thousand stories. So if you put at least one word of God well into people. Their lives will change. So you have to believe that the word of God itself is the greatest power in the world. In Matthew chapter eight, a centurion said, "Only speak a word. For I also am a, a man under authority, having hundreds of soldiers under me. If I say to them, move, and they move." If a command of thousands say a word, a thousand people move, and if an emperor says a word, a whole nation moves. Then, if the Lord says, "My servant will be healed immediately," he believed in the power of the word of the Lord. The Lord created the universe with the word, and He is holding it with the word of His power and saved the people with the word. So His word saves people's souls who are healed. Who are headed for hell? Then what will hold a person's heart? The word. So you must believe in the power, power of God's word. Meditate on it and have at least some verses so that you can put one word into the souls. So only when you believe in the power of the word can the word establish the souls. Let's let's look at the scripture. So Jeremiah chapter twenty three. Chapter twenty three, verse twenty eight. Verse twenty eight. The prophet has a dream. Let him tell a dream, and he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? Says the Lord. Seeing something in a dream and telling it is only only the chaff, but God's word received and spoken is wheat. The word of God is like wheat, so if it is planted, it will sprout and bear fruit. Because where the word goes, the Holy Spirit goes. So as Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So the Holy Spirit goes where the word goes. So when you sow the word of God, the Holy Spirit works at the same time. So just as rain and snow they fall from heaven, water the ground and make it bear fruit, when the word of God comes down, it brings results. So we need to know that we have no power, but the word we trust and preach has power. So what all teachers need to, what all teachers need is the word of God rather than means and methods. So you have to try to plant the word in. In an easy way and very clearly, when you have one to one with one to one fellowship,、uh, fellowship. So if you plant one word well, the Holy Spirit can work in it and change that person. So, so it is simple, right? So you only need to know that what you have to hold fast is the word. And the thing you need to put into the person during the fellowship is the word. So, other than reading a lot of other books, there are scriptures that really help your Christian life. Plant them in your heart, so that you can also plant one into others during the fellowship.
the Lord said, Obey your parents in the Lord. So memorize that verse and talk about the importance of obedience because it is according to the word. How great it would, it would be if one word could change the, change the students. They believe what their teachers say even though they don't listen to their parents because the teachers said they believe. On top of that, the word of God enters into them. So how great it, it would be that the worldly people use the masses of the world. The devil knows the heart of men. He doesn't know everything, but knows a lot, a lot about how to stir up people. That's why the devil creates a lot of video clips and music to stir up people's hearts. So in that way, the devil stirs up people's hearts and continues to drive them to hell. The devil has many schemes to get people on his side. And just like that, the Christians have to study how to lead the souls we meet to the arms of the Lord and establish them. So you have to study based on the word, just as and just as Job meticulously took care of his children. We also need to study how to establish the people we meet and how to kindle the fire of faith in them. So we need to study. We must first be based on the word and then we should study peripheral things on how to plant the words effectively. And, and what is the most important thing that moves people's hearts? What's the lever that moves people's hearts? You all know that. Love. Love is the key. The love is the key to moving people's hearts. Now that teacher really takes pity on my soul. He really wants my soul to prosper. He is concerned about my soul day and night. He's praying for my soul. When the children feel that, they are established. The most important key to moving their hearts What's more, important, what's more important than buying them sweets is to make them feel the teacher cares about my soul. She really wants my soul to be getting along well. She's praying for my soul. She really loves me. If they can feel that, they change soon, quickly. So if they are taught in that way, the teaching enters into them. Let's go to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. Chapter 27, verse 19. Let's read together. As in water face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. As in water face reflects face. A person's heart reveals the person. So if my head goes to a person, the head of the person is moved. If the heart if my heart goes to the person, that that person's heart is moved. If my soul goes, that person's soul is moved. If the person feels my love towards his soul, his soul is moved. So what is the most important thing that moves the soul? Compassion and love towards the soul. Will move the soul. That's nothing greater than these. And it is important to grow our love. That's why the word and love are important. And if a teacher really has faith, he really make he will make the learner also have faith. If a teacher has love, he will make the learner also have love. People go through adolescence as they pass through their teens. But if you plant the word in them well at their young age, later they will be established. I think God made it in that way. Every student has adolescence. 
everyone has. The students who do not study in particular go through that period more severely, don't they? Others who study, that ha study hard pass through re relatively easily, but those who study less are more attacked by the devil, so it's more difficult to establish them. In any case, teachers have to study. So when they watch t so when you watch TV or listen to the radio or look at any object, you should keep thinking about how to raise children properly and establish them properly. You have to keep studying and take notes. In doing so, the Lord will continually give you wisdom, and as much as you make the effort, the Lord, the Lord will give you wisdom. So let's move on to the goal of teaching. Let's look at Psalm 34. So verse 11, 34 verse 11, let's read it together. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What's the goal for teachers? You calm your children. Listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So what's the ultimate goal of teachers? The ultimate goal is to make the students fear the Lord, honor God, and live a God-centered life. So if our children become people who can serve God, if they grow as people who fear God, then it is successful. The goal is to teach them to fear the Lord. So what does it mean to fear God? David said, verse 12, Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So to fear the Lord is to keep our tongue from evil and our lips from deceitful speech. Be careful with tongue and forsake evil and do good. And also to make the students to forsake evil and do good. So we should make them keep away from evil and follow good so that they can obey their parents and have good relationship with their siblings, honoring elders, obeying and submitting to God's word and saving souls and preaching to souls. So all of these are good works. So the ultimate goal is to make the students live a God-centered life. When our children ask for bread, none of us will give them stones. But we should be careful not to give stones to the people and our students who come to us instead of bread. Stones have no life. The devil gives stones instead of bread. He gives serpents instead of fish and scorpions instead of, instead of eggs. We have to give the bread of life to the students who come to us. The fish symbolizes the devotion. So it will be our important responsibility to make our children be able to present themselves to the Lord and give them um, and, and to give them eggs, eggs so that the work of the gospel will be manifested through them in the future. So with the words in Psalm 34, we briefly looked at what new teachers should think, consider. So now, now So now let's sum up. So first of all, in order to become a good teacher, you have to have persistence as mentioned in verse one, at all times and continually. The persistence, not impulse. So even after one year, two years, three years, and four years, you should still be able to continue, continue 
with the ministry, with patients. There could be difficulties, but I want you to continue and be persistent, persistent once you started. The Lord will bless you while you do it continually. It is necessary to be firm and, and firm and consistent. Second, the reason we are used is not because we are perfect. As David said, this poor man, we should continually get to know how weak we are. The more we receive the light of the Lord, the more we realize that we are lacking. And those who know their own shortcomings and weaknesses can bear the shortcomings of the brothers and sisters. And when they see the shortcomings of the students, they can understand by reminding themselves that they were the same in the past. And when the students have, the, have a difficulty, it could be nothing in our view, but to them it's serious. So we shouldn't say, oh dear, that shouldn't be a problem. Why are you troubled by it? It is serious to the children in that age. So those who experience themselves are poor and weak can understand others who are in pain. So when you have a humble heart, you can empathize with them and establish them. The third one, you have to pray. A person of prayer, saving and establishing souls cannot be done without God's help. So you have to go into your room and spend time with the Lord. In order to make the period of judges not come to our lives, we have to ask the Lord and always ask for God's help and then walk. Only then order will be in our lives and there will be no confusion. Fourth, teachers need experience of faith. You need experiences whether you live your Christian life by yourself or you are connected with students. So you should pray that the Lord will give you appropriate experiences. And Continually try to have certain experiences of faith as you pray, evangelize and serve. So please take notes of those experiences so that you can, uh, they can be used appropriately for establishing the students, not for boasting yourself. So when a certain student is having a hard time, if you experience the same difficulty, you can help them say, Oh, when I had, uh, or oh, when I also had went through the same difficulty, I did this, and the Lord helped me. If you talk to them with your experiences, you may establish them. So, it is necessary to have faith experiences so that those experiences become your basis. So the Lord will make you go through various things as you live after being saved. If you always receive it with thanksgiving, the Lord will turn it into a good experience. So as the Bible says, taste and see the Lord is good, the more you taste and experience, the greater power you will have. The fifth, the teachers must have a bright heart. When dealing with children, you should approach them with a bright heart. So even if you have a big pain, you should make sure to have a bright heart when you see children. So also you will have to be careful not to become a depressed or irritable teacher. Sixth, you should not fall into satisfaction thinking that it is enough, but constantly progress with a longing heart because we have so much to conquer. So you need to more care about it and then you need training and think of your ministry as a big thing, not a small thing. In, in addition to that, you have to be careful and be an example in speech and behavior. So you should not say the words that criticize, demean or slander others in front of students, but rather giving of thanks, praising the Lord, saying what is fitting for, for a Christian. And because teachers are people who teach, you have to study. So of course you need study methods, but the most important thing is to have the assurance in God's word. So you have to study with assurance in God's word and the purpose of planting the word properly. 
What is the key to moving students' hearts? What is the key to access their hearts? What be the most important thing? Faith and love. So if you have strong faith, really try to love the students and act with the love. I believe that their hearts will certainly be touched, and they will follow you and appreciate you. They will surely do so. And out of all the teachers who taught them, who would be the most impressive teacher? A teacher who taught with love will never be forgotten for the rest of their lives. Who would they feel that they have been helped the most? The teacher who loved them the most. It doesn't mean you have to buy them a lot of food. Even if you don't buy them anything special, the children will know if you love them. They will definitely feel that love. The teacher cares about me. Really loves me. And try to understand me. When I suffer, he suffers with me and grieves with me, and also he rejoices with me. So when the children feel that you you are really that kind of teacher, they will follow you, follow you, and be attentive to you. And try to be a good stu- students in front of you. They really do. So, and what is the final goal? Teach the fear of the Lord. So you should keep thinking what you can do to make the children fear God. So to fear God is to hate evil. So you should make them hate evil and cling to what is good. And we should continue to teach principles to those who are in the middle of adolescence, even if they are suffering. So if you continue to teach them the principles, even though they go sideways, they will eventually come back. So you have to always try to te- try to teach the principles. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So we've summed up the whole topic. Do you ha- do you have any questions? If not, let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, who is full of grace and love. Please give wisdom and understanding to the brothers and sisters gathered here, and help them understand the importance of this ministry. And above all, help them believe in your power and the and the power of your word. What we need the most is that is not methods and means. We have no power and lack in many things, but we learn together that. Love and compassion for students are important. Help us to fear and glorify you in our lives first, and through that, may we see the great work that our students will also be established before you. Please guide us and help us for the rest of the day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.